thank you for coming and welcome you for, to, for being here. Um, the Benedictine Institute and the Collegeville Institute are co-sponsoring this event today. And um, as I don't know, some of you may not know that, but uh, Lunch and Learn events are professional development opportunities for employees and guests to learn a little bit more about the Benedictine aspects of where we work. And we usually offer um, at least one a semester, sometimes two a semester. So uh, just an email announcements, bulletin board. So if you want to watch for next semesters, um, we have a pretty special guest for next, next semester too. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, it's Dr. Samuel Thomas, but I found out very quickly that he responds nicely to Sam, so. <laughs> uh, um, he is an associate professor of religion at California Lutheran University. That's in Thousand Oaks, California. He teaches courses in biblical studies, environmental ethics, and religion and culture. He also teaches a short course in woodworking for art majors. And he's been a furniture maker for over 15 years. He is a 1994 graduate from St. John's. He, gra he graduated with biology. So, a biology major. So I, I asked him, how do you get from biology to teaching theology? But he really had a pretty good answer for me. So uh, he got his advanced degrees at Yale University Divinity School and the University of Notre Dame. He's published several books and articles on the Dead Sea Scrolls and is currently a resident scholar at the Collegeville Institute where he's working on a book on the theme of paying attention. And I asked him who we're supposed to pay when we pay attention. So. <laughs> Um, I, and since that's the end of the info he gave me, but I have um, since learned that he's become pretty involved with the, the wood, the Abbey Woodworking Shop, and he's been volunteering down there, keeping Mike Roski in line, <laughs> and <laughs> trying, and he's been able to finish um, one piece of furniture while he's been here, and He's also, he also got involved with the, the Stick Works house um, out in the Arboretum. He was pretty involved with that. He's a great cook. He's, he's a good neighbor. He, he, his office is right next door to mine. So. And as the registration numbers were growing, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100, I'd keep him informed and he'd, you know, he's kind of like, hmm. So I don't know if it was it's if it's living in California that he has he's just laid back or if, or if that Johnny demeanor you know the the confident oh well that's cool you know <laughs> but um, you know there are some people here who do remember you Sam when you were a student <laughs> and, you know when you were 18 and 19 years old there you know teachers colleagues people you used to work with and. I do remember reading in the Bible that there's a verse that says that a prophet in his own land is not easily honored. So, <laughs> uh, on that note, no pressure, Sam, but this better be good. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Sam. Well, thank you, Chick. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to the Benedictine Institute and, um, and to Chick Hardy for organizing this event, um, to, uh, to Father Hilary Timish and Father Mark Thamert for their, uh, their invitation to do this. Um, I'd like to thank also the Collegeville Institute and um, for a, just an incredibly wonderful time during my stay there. Um, it's coming to a close, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sad about that. Um, I'd also like to thank the folks in the Abbey Woodworking Shop, Father John Miaska and Mike Roski and Robert Lillard and Lou Groby and others um, for the hospitality that they extended to me during my stay here. You know, when I first um, contacted Father John and said, hey, do you mind if I come and work in the woodshop? I wasn't really sure what, what kind of response I would get because 
that you know that can be a good or a bad thing, I suppose. Um, but but I experienced nothing but hospitality and uh, and openness there, and so um, it's really been a wonderful wonderful time. And of course, it is great to be back, and I, I make no claims to being a prophet of any sort. Um, but it is wonderful to be back in my <clears throat> both in my hometown. I grew up in St. Cloud um, and at St. John's, where where I, I have you know spent several important years <clears throat> in my life. So. Uh, and, and thanks to all of you for, for coming out today. And thanks also to the, um, to the dining service um, who made this meal possible and a uh, de very delicious meal. So we've all heard that we live in an age of distractions. Whether those distractions are evaluated positively or negatively will, of course, depend on one's perspective. And no doubt you've heard that, uh, or, or no doubt that what counts as a distraction depends largely on what counts as attention. Take a moment to think to yourself about what an average day looks like for you. How much time do you spend interacting with technology of various sorts? Roughly how many times a day do you check your email, phone, and other devices? Do you focus on one task for an extended period of time, or do you move from one thing to another in quick succession? I'd be willing to bet that at least some people in, in this room, at some point in the next 30 minutes, are going to think about looking at a smartphone are going to actually look at that smartphone <laughs> or maybe even divert attention away from what I'm saying in order to reply to a text that apparently cannot possibly wait for another few minutes. Maybe now that I've said this, you're less likely to do that. Um, <laughs> and actually, um, then again, this morning I was, I was looking on Facebook uh, and I came across a post from a friend of mine who apparently was at some sort of conference and she posted um, that she was at a great workshop but the current presenter doesn't relate to anything I work on. Time to tweet and Facebook. <laughs> so uh, I, I know that that impulse is strong, um, but I, you know, I, I will ask that you continue to uh, at, least, at least look at me kind of while I'm, <laughs> while I'm doing this. Now you've probably heard that uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about multitasking as well, whether it's possible, whether it exists, whether we should believe in multitasking. Um, and, uh, and what it does to us and what it does for us. Most of us, I think, are so accustomed to doing several things at once um, that switching rapidly from one thing to another is really no big deal. Instead of isolating our focus on one single object or task, we pay what psychologists call continuous partial attention. We're never actually multitasking, but unless we're Buddhist monks who have perfected the art of meditative breathing, we experience attention as being a rather fluid engagement with both our internal states and external realities. We, we do what uh, Winifred Gallagher in her book, Wrapped, we do what she calls, um, you know, uh, distilling the, the universe into your universe. And I'm, I'm not going to read that whole thing, but, um, but this is a, the, the basic idea of attention is that it's a, it's a certain kind of complex series of, of, of processes that do that basic function for us, distill the universe into your universe. So there's mounting neurobiological evidence that our brains are actually changing in response to our constant interactions with the internet and other communication technologies, such that interactions render us less physiologically capable of sustained attention over time, um, uh, even if we would want to do that. So some set off alarm bells about this development. Nicholas Carr, for example, in his book, The Shallows, writes that we program our computers and then thereafter they program us. They program us to shift our attention rapidly from one thing to another and to avoid the kind of careful, sustained attention to any given moment or activity. On the other hand, people like Kathy Davidson in her book, Now You See It, is more optimistic about how we can use technology to transform our institutions to adapt to new, a new understanding of attention, how it works and, and what we should do with it. Now, I'm actually not here to talk about the internet or about technology in general. But starting this way helps to frame the question I'd like to ask. What is attention or attentiveness? What does it matter for how we engage in work? And what does it contribute to our individual and community well-being? I'm going to try to get at this, some, some of these questions by talking about woodworking um, as a practice of attention and as a metaphor for work more generally. Now, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things today. I'm actually going to take off my jacket because I'm getting serious now. <laughs> Pope Paul VI stated in his 1967 encyclical 
God gave human beings intelligence, sensitivity, and the power of thought, tools with which to finish and perfect the work God began. Every worker is, to some extent, a creator, whether artist, craftsperson, executive, laborer, or farmer. And this is actually a sentiment that was anticipated in the St. John's University Bulletin. And we're, none of us in this room are surprised that things that come out of the Vatican actually happen here first, usually. Um, <laughs> Thanks for laughing at that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> this is something that was anticipated in the St. John's University Bulletin in the early 1950s. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, you know that, that once awakened, creative self-expression tends to spread to other fields uh, of making. A human created in the image and likeness of God is naturally a maker. Now, these, these texts both have gender-specific language, which I've adapted. Um, to be more inclusive, but whatever the case there, a, um, there is a creative element, or there should be a creative element in all kinds of work. And as such, there's a relationship between worker and work that is facilitated by the human faculty of attention. Alan Wallace writes in his book, The Attention Revolution. <laughs> now, I honestly do not know how my own relationship to woodworking would change if I depended upon it to, um, in, you know, in George Bush's famous terms, to put food on my family. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was talking about this, this problem the other day with, um, with the guys in their wood shop, and, and I asked them, you know, as I'm, as I'm working on this book project, how can I avoid romanticizing um, manual work and, uh, you know, romanticizing woodworking um, when I write and speak about it? And Father John Miasco's answer was, Go down to the shop and hit your thumb with a hammer. <laughs> which, which I think is excellent advice. <laughs> now, I don't want to be one of those intellectuals who traffic in precious images of manual work. It can, in certain circumstances, be onerous, degrading, oppressive. But I still think manual work has things to teach even those who do not engage directly with it. Craftspersonship provides a kind of ideal one that is not always realizable, but one that's worth holding up in any case. When I'm at my best, my own attention and patience extend beyond the time spent in the wood shop. I now wait and watch to see what different woods and finishes and joints will do over time so that I can more carefully and completely understand what I'm doing in the process of building. When we pay attention, we bring our full selves to a task, a problem, another person, to the art of living well or to the attitude of reverence. Paying attention pulls us outside ourselves, our expectations, our desires, our attempts to shape reality into our own images. And it means not only being responsible to, to the world in a new way, it can also lead to surprise and wonder and self-discovery. Attention requires that we focus upon an object of our concern, that we give ourselves over to it in a manner of speaking. Mastery of work derives from attention paid over time to the intricacies and nuances of a given set of tasks and from being incrementally challenged to improve and expand our range. We may be inclined to think that mastery is incompatible with reverence, and yet any reflective craftsperson is likely to agree that deep skill is the result of a sustained interaction with materials that have taught the maker how and what to make. In other words, it's precisely the craftsperson's constant confrontation with human limitations that animates the work of making. Attention allows the maker to be in control to one degree or another of design, process, and the movements of the body to manipulate materials, but the awareness that how one does these things is limited by the nature of the materials and the tools themselves, and this, I think, inspires an attitude of reverence. Take the building of a table. If I set out to fashion an item that may be used for eating meals in the way that most Americans uh, expect to do, it would be strange for me to place the table top at a 45 degree angle relative to the floor. The item might resemble a table, and it might be an interesting work of art, uh, it would no longer really function as a table, at least without the use of super glue or lots of Velcro and spill-proof containers. Now, I'm constrained in the building of a table by the conventions of table making. I can, however, maintain an attitude of reverence for what a table is and allow for my own interpretation within those constraints. This is what makes for design, variety, and beauty in the making of tables. 
There's reverence, there's inspiration, both of which I think derive from attention in its receptive mode. And some makers understand their work to derive primarily from, ex from an external source, an inspiration or intuition that participates in the already given form of a work. D.H. Lawrence famously stated about his own writing, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. And to give a woodworking example, George Nakashima was famous for his assertion that his craft was simply to bring the interior desire of the object into its fullness, to serve as the physical vehicle by which the innate wish of a tree might become what it was already waiting to be. Lewis Hyde, in his book, The Gift, refers to this same phenomenon. He says, you work and, at a task and you work and work and still it won't come right. Then when you're not even thinking about it while spading the garden or stepping into the bus, the whole thing pops into your head, the missing grace is bestowed. The gift will continue to just charge its energy so long as we t attend to it in return. So how should we understand attention in light of this passivity of the creator in moments of inspiration? What's the relationship between the careful attention to detail required to make objects of value or to do most any kind of work well in the creative work of the imagination when it's prompted by the gift discharging its energy. Now recently I was sitting in a chair designed by a famous architect who also designed um, the building in which I'm staying at the Collegeville Institute and I noticed that the chairs, there were two of them facing a window um, overlooking a beautiful lake and I thought that they would benefit by having a little table between them. And so I set myself to thinking about what kind of table would be suitable. And after trying to work through ideas carefully, the answer came out of nowhere. The table would draw its inspiration from another building nearby, one whose shape was itself calling out to be modified into a table. Perhaps my receptivity to this idea was shaped by a prior long-standing engagement with the art and craft of table making. In other words, it's because I have become attuned to the tableness of tables and all of their variations that I've acquainted myself with what is required in the building of tables that new forms of tables suggest themselves to me even when I'm not attempting to design one. Or perhaps uh, it's because Marcel Breuer was correct that his bell banner would serve as a symbol, a distinctive silhouette to be carried in the mind. In my mind, over all these years. And perhaps that might explain both the design of the table um, that I, the, the bell banner side table that I designed um, and, and built here in the Abbey Wood Shop, but I think it also may help to explain or may suggest that um, I seem to have been playing with this form in various ways um, over the last decade or so without really being conscious of it. Now in her book, Gravity and Grace, Simone Weil suggests that we do need to bring our past experiences and images to bear in the ways that we pay attention. But that all this is in the service of something higher, an openness to the divine and to the possibility of unexpected grace. Attention consists of suspending our thought leaving it detached, empty, and ready to be penetrated by the object. It means holding in our minds within reach of this thought, but on a lower level and not in contact with it, the diverse knowledge we have required, which we are forced to make use of. Now, is it possible that we can live our lives in this way? Whatever the answer to that question, um, I'm reminded that in chapter 57 of his rule, St. Benedict provides some guidelines for the artisans of a monastic community. Here he says that no one kind of work is more important than another. And if one particular person starts to feel uppity about what they're doing, they're to be removed from that position. Now, uh, I'm not sure how that principle actually plays out within the university setting. Um, but he says, if there are artisans in the monastery, let them practice their crafts with all humility provided the abbot has given permission, but if any one of them becomes conceited over his skill and his craft because he seems to be conferring a benefit on the monastery, let him be taken from his craft and no longer exercise it. Now there's a crucial insight here, I think. Attention to the work we do is not disconnected from the attention that we pay to other people. 
if we're going to be obedient in the sense that Benedict means here, for to listen and be attentive and to trust one another, we must carry that attitude over into the work that we do. If we insist that we are always right or that our work is more important than, than another's, we have missed the point about the role of attention in meaningful and fulfilling work. In her book, Friend of the Soul, Norveen Vest says that Benedict's teachings about artisans can apply to all dimensions of human work. She breaks down Benedict's teaching into this area into three basic principles. First, having a vision of one's work as a contribution among many to the whole life of the community. Second, don't overcharge or commit fraud, which I think is generally good advice, but I think also can be taken as, you know, generally be, be uh, honest and, um, and upright in your dealings. And third, in all things, glorify God. Father David Ransom put it this way in his essay on Buddhist and Christian monasticism in dialogue. He says, when we situate the different nuances that Benedict has for obedience, we begin to realize that it's a lot more than just doing what one is told. It is more radically about developing a deep attentiveness in life. This receptivity is essential in the process of conversion and transformation. Woodworking has helped me to develop a deeper attentiveness in the ways I have been talking about today, both in terms of control over specific tasks and in terms of receptivity. But there's always progress to be made. The shop has been for me a kind of soul craft that has been deeply shaped by my encounter with this place and with the Benedictine tradition that guides it. And I've learned that attention, while perhaps still difficult to define, is an important key to working and living well. Thank you.